Thank you, ma'am, for a very warm uh, uh, introduction. So, uh, first of all, I like to thank Dr. Sahu and Dr. Rutul for inviting me here, and to Dr. Sashaya for making me a part of the close uh, Dipsy family. So, I will be talking on PCOS to GDM. Is it inevitable? So, uh, I think we have been talking since yesterday about the spectrum of beta cell dysfunction which occurs across the life course. And PCOS is a multi-system uh, endocrinopathy which is involving the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the ovary, the adrenals, the liver, the pancreas, skin and the adipose tissue. And it all starts in the utero. We have just had, uh, heard Dr. Usha, Dr. Sashaya sir, Dr. Sashank and everyone else who talked about fetal programming and the Barker's hypothesis where whenever the woman is obese, she is having PCOS, she has hyperandrogenism or she has hypertension or GDM, there is fetal programming. A baby born less than 2.5 kgs or more than 3.5 kgs has develops visceral obesity, hyperinsulinemia, adipose tissue dysfunction. She has a premature uh, menarche and precocious puberty. They develop PCOS. They are presenting to us most frequently with irregular menstrual cycle. Later on, they develop infertility after marriage. They struggle and get pregnant where they develop GDM and the associated complications like overweight, and uh, hypertension and all the adverse fetal maternal outcomes as she grows up in the postpartum period and later on she develops type 2 diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia and further on in life she develops coronary artery disease, uh, endometrial cancer and breast cancer because of unexposed, unopposed estrogen proliferation. So, diagnosis of PCOS, we all know, it is according to the Rotterdam criteria, any two of the three following features, oligomenorrhea, that is irregular cycles, clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism or polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, where the follicles ranging in size from 2 to 9 millimeters are arranged peripherally with a dense hyperechoic stroma, which signifies hyperandrogenemia and significant insulin resistance. So, taking these three combinations and permutations, we can divide it into four phenotypes. The type A, B and C are the hyperandrogenic and type D is only oligomenorrhea and PCOS picture on ultrasound. So, what we wondered was endocrine and metabolic profile, does it differ in the four phenotypes of PCOS? So, we conducted this study in Lady Harding and what we found were that all phenotypes of PCOS had deranged endocrine and metabolic profile as compared to weight and age matched non-PCOS patients. And another important finding was that insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome was maximum in the complete phenotype OH plus P and the hyperandrogenic ONH which requires a more strict vigilant uh, surveillance all throughout because even these young girls with PCOS had significant metabolic disorders. We have seen that most of our women are obese with PCOS but we also come across some girls who are having lean phenotype. So, we wanted to see the relationship of clinical hormonal and endocrinological metabolic uh, presentation with relation to BMI. So, we did this study and what we found was that hirsutism which we measured by the Ferriman Galway objective scoring uh, came down from 32 uh, was maximum 52 in uh, that is 89 percent in overweight was 80 percent even in lean and this was significantly higher as compared to the control group where none of them had high hirsutism. Irregular cycle, acanthosis and acne again was significantly more in both the PCOS groups as compared to the controls. However, it was significantly high in overweight as compared to the lean. Coming to the endocrinological profile, LH and testosterone were very high as you can see in the lean, they are even higher than the overweight group 
and these two groups were significantly higher than controls. Now coming to the metabolic uh, parameters, we found that the family history of diabetes, deranged lipid profile, impaired GTT, fasting insulin and 2 hours post 75 gram insulin were again significantly maximum in the overweight group followed by lean group just see 52 the last uh, row 52 in the lean group 95 in the overweight group and only 36 which was significantly higher as compared to the controls so what we were finding in the OPDs was that uh, the BMI of uh, PCOS patients was significantly higher but the fasting plasma glucose and fasting insulin levels were similar in both the groups. So we did this 2 hour post insulin level and found it to be significantly higher in PCOS patients as compared to the controls. Please note fasting insulin levels were normal in both the uh, groups. So we also measured the area under the glucose curve, area under the insulin curve and insulogenic index. What we found was that 2 hour post glucose insulin levels correlated uh, significantly with area under the curve of glucose and insulin and insulogenic index and therefore we found this as a very useful clinical marker not doing fasting unnecessarily because most of the patients have normal fasting glucose and uh, insulin levels. So we also understand, we, this is another uh, paper, the gene polymorphism which is associated with metabolic features in PCOS. We found association of IL-1B and IL-1RA and FABP1 both in PCOS, in GDM and in diabetes. And the novel biomarkers are also com common amongst all these three things. The anisfatin 1, FETUNA, kispeptin and copeptin are raised in all. So uh, uh, another study where we found the correlation of serum nisfatin 1 level with metabolic and clinical parameters in Indian women with PCOS. We took 40 PCOS women and 40 age and BMI matched controls and we found that nisfatin levels were 10 times higher in the PCOS women as compared to the controls. And this correlated significantly with postprandial blood glucose level. Another study where we found that the association of FETUNA, kispeptin, copeptin uh, had a significant higher level and they correlated very well. Just mind you, these are very young girls, just PCOS girls, correlated positively with carotid intima thickness. Many of these patients had fatty liver. We could not do the fiber optic scan, so I am not showing it here, but they have a significantly higher number of fatty liver, HbA1c, waist hip ratio, LH testosterone and high triglycerides and cholesterol levels. Now coming, this is all Indian data done at Lady Harding. Now coming to the international guidelines. In sync with what Dr. Sasheya says, the recent 2023 international evidence-based guidelines which have been uh, made by consensus of all these seven societies, the international societies, they all recommended oral GTT uh, as the most accurate test to assess glycemic status and they all say that when these women become pregnant or planning to get pregnancy, they should get it done at the earliest in the first visit. What our DIPSI says uh, in 2014? they are also uh, echoing the same thoughts. So the cardiovascular risk, they said all women with PCOS should be assessed for cardiovascular disease uh, risk factors. They should all have a lipid profile done, BP should be measured and they go on to say that cardiovascular general population guidelines should consider the inclusion of PCOS as a cardiovascular risk factor. Progression from PCOS to GDM, we all know that it is a continuum as progressively the beta cell function deteriorates, these uh, problems manifest. So this is a beautiful systematic review and meta-analysis uh, which was published very recently and they have included 21 studies involving 4,841 women with PCOS and 11 million controls. They found the odds ratio of 3.5. 
5 age for development of GDM in women with PCOS as compared to the controls. Another study showing the association between PCOS and the uh, risk of pregnancy complications the, the GDM they found the relative risk was as high as 2.78. So we need to catch these women young and we have to focus on these women in fact, I would say we need to focus on the children who are born to uh, mothers with GDM. And this is another uh, uh, continuing the spectrum, the risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus after GDM. This study included 1,809 publication including 28 million women with GDM. 78,000 had a type 2 GDM at 6 weeks or later after delivery with a pooled and just unadjusted relative risk of 8.92 for developing diabetes. So how to prevent progression of PCOS to GDM? We know that it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. Only the obstetrician gynecologist cannot do it alone. It has to be linked and collaborative effort of the physician, the endocrinologist, the dermatologist, the uh, uh, pediatrician and also the nursing educators and the nutritionists. We all have to join hands and start them on lifestyle modification including the behavioral changes, diet control, exercise and stress management. The three problems with which they come to us, the obstetricians, menstrual irregularity, hyperandrogenic, uh, hyperandrogenemia and infertility, they can be targeted by insulin sensitizers other than the uh, OCPs and the ciproteron acetate, spironolactone, flutamide, finasteride for hyperandrogenism and ovulation induction drugs. Morbid obesity should be treated by semaglutide, liraglutide or metabolic surgeries. Behavioral strategies, it is very, very important because we know most of these problems are uh, metabolic and lifestyle diseases problem. We have to tell them what is the target of blood pressure, weight and uh, blood sugar values and we have to set the goals realistically. Then they have to do self-monitoring, uh, control the stimulus, problem solving, assertiveness training. They need to eat slowly, take small portions of meals, take a small thali, reinforcing the changes, relapse prevention. So the key for retention adherence and maintenance of healthy lifestyle is support and continuous engagement. Dietary interventions, we know 50 to 70 percent of the women with PCOS are obese and Madam has beautifully illustrated that we need to bring down the weight preconceptionally before they become pregnant. Healthy eating uh, principle across the life course, even a small reduction of 2 to 5 percent will restore metabolic and reproductive function. Tailor diet as per the food preference and according to the socio-economic and uh, ethnic uh, propensity. I intervention of exercise 150 minutes per week, moderate exercise or 75 minutes vigorous exercise, muscle strengthening exercise two times a week. Adolescents ke liye uh, 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical exercise, also increasing the walking, cycling, climbing the stairs, not using the lift, games, 10,000 steps including 30 minutes of structured physical activity. So the exercise intervention needs to have very smart goals. What do I mean by smart goals? They have to be specific, measurable, achievable relevant and time oriented. We need to use the fitness tracking devices for this and you can start slow bouts of 10 minutes progressive increasing by 5% every day and the insulin sensitizers play an important role. We all know about metformin, N-acetylcysteine 600 milligram 8 hourly, inositols, d inositol, myo-inositol are also showing very good results. Recently, we did a ICMR project where we compared N-acetylcysteine and metformin in comparing insulin resistance in PCOS women. The uh, NAC, the N-acetylcysteine also reduced insulin res resistance, but it was significantly uh, less as compared to metformin. Regarding metformin, it is coming up in international guidelines. The PCOS guidelines recommend that it should be considered for use in PCOS girls who have BMI more than 
and the third column says less than 25 also they should be considered for adolescents who are at risk of developing PCOS and this is another study where we studied the effect of metformin therapy in PCOS patients. Six months of metformin therapy was given and what we found after six months was that the mean hirsutism score reduced from 14.8 to 9.4 ferryman galway score, uh, irregular cycle, acne, ultrasound picture of PCOS all uh, uh, became better significantly. Again, LH, testosterone and progesterone increase. Even the BMI came down after six months of therapy. And sometimes we have to give it for a longer time. When these girls become pregnant, we continue it throughout pregnancy. It also showed uh, reduction in insulin levels and triglyceride level. This is a beautiful paper which says that if you continue, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis which says if you continue metformin throughout, it is going to result in uh, vaginal delivery, reduce early preterm birth uh, and complications of GDM and PIH. We are all doing, most of us obstetricians are following this, although the ADA 2023 said metformin should be discontinued after first trimester. This is the uh, diabetes prevention program and di uh, which says that metformin reduced the incidence of type 2 diabetes by 31% compared to placebo after average follow-up of 2.8 years and by 18% over 10 to 15 years post-randomization and this was very very important for GDM women. Sir has just enumerated this brilliant concept of prediction and prevention of GDM and its sequelae by administering metformin in the early weeks of pregnancy before 8 weeks of gestation. And this, this beautiful paper, Premidial Prevention, Futuristic Approach to Intervene in GDM and its sequelae. NAC is a L-amino acid, uh, cysteine acid, mucolytic agent which we are using. Uh, these days for reducing insulin resistance. This is especially useful for girls because we cannot keep them giving metformin for a very, very long time. And some of them have GI symptoms. So this is another uh, drug which is FSSAI approved drug which can be given. Inositol is another good drug, B-complex derivative which reduces insulin resistance. So to conclude, comprehensive management of PCOS requires a joint hand collaboration between different physical uh, specialists, uh, the, a patient-centered lifestyle management, role of metformin in improving the clinical, endocrinological and metabolic features and also in delaying, preventing GDM, diabetes and metabolic syndrome is evidence-based now. Optimization of health of women with PCOS before conception will prevent because as sir says, GDM is the mother of all NCDs. It is going to reduce the intergenerational transmission of the disease. We need to catch them young. And I thank you all for a, for a patient here.